Sarah McCaffrey is a research forester for the Forest Service, whose research focuses on the social aspects of fire management. This has included a broad range of work examining key dynamics before and during fires, including public acceptance of prescribed fire and views on overall fire management. Her work also includes um, includes how stakeholders conceive of becoming a fire adapted community and barriers to the increased use of fire as a management tool, um, both prescribed fire and managing fires for resource benefits. Today we're lucky enough to have her talking about evacuation decision making. So we'll get Sarah set up here and continue on from here. Over to you, Sarah. Okay. Oh, I'm going too fast. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to be talking about something slightly different from all those lovely, lovely technical maps. Um, and I'm going to talk sort of about what we've been learning from, what I've been learning from various projects I have with evac around evacuation decision making. And most of it's going to revolve around a specific project with a paper called Do I Stay or Do I Go or Do I Wait and See? Could not resist using that title. Um, but to start, I think the th key, there's a few things that are important to think about when we talk about wildfire evacuation. It's actually not at all a straightforward process. So with a hurricane, we have a long lead time where we have a pretty good sense where it's gonna land, you know, that cone, and there's usually some decent sense about how strong it's gonna be. So there's a fair level of predictability, whereas wildfire, very difficult to predict. You might have five days lead time, you might have two minutes lead time. If you have a wind change, you might have thought you were fine and now you're not. And so that creates a whole slew of complexities around wildfire evacuation in terms of predicting who should evacuate and when they need to evacuate. It's not always possible to evacuate if you don't have enough warning time or trees have fallen across the road. Um, and then the other thing that makes wildfire kind of different is that there's trade-offs. So with a hurricane, once you've battened down the hatches and boarded up your windows, um, there is no advantage to your staying with your property. It doesn't increase the odds that it's going to survive the storm. Whereas with wildfire, there is evidence that if people stick around and put out embers and those sorts of things, um, you can increase the odds that your house is going to survive. But again, this depends on the context, right? So in Australia, they sort of treated it as equally viable and then realized, well, it is viable to stay and defend unless it's extreme conditions, in which case it isn't. So again, the context of the decision really depends on the fire. There is no single decision that's going to lead to, uh, that will always lead to better outcomes. But the three main options that there are, are leave early, and that has the best protection for life, um, but it's not always feasible. Um, it limits your ability to take actions to protect your property, and that may not even be sticking around to put out embers, but simply um, doing things on your property to clean it up and that sort of thing. Um, and there's, it, you also have some level of a loss of control. I've definitely talked to homeowners who talk about staying because once they leave, they don't know what's going on at their property, they can't do anything about it, and they really dislike that. Uh, then we have the wait and see, which is kind of trying to sort of well, well, let's stick around, do what we can. That does minimize potential evacuation costs. It's important to remember that evacuation is not cost-free. It, it takes people's time, it might just, it disrupts your life, it can cost you money. So if, if evacuation is not actually a simple ask. Um, and so waiting and seeing, it minimizes. You might not have to evacuate. Um, but the problem with that is if you wait too long or the wind changes and you get caught, most deaths are, occur while people are evacuating late. So that increases the risk of life. Stay and defend is, increases the odds of home survival. Um, you need to be active. You can't just shelter in place is actually not really a good option unless you have no other options. Um, but if you can evacuate, there's more protection inside your structure than outside, but you need to actively put out embers so that the house is there to actually not, and not burning up to protect you but it does increase the potential loss for life because you are more at risk. So there's these trade-offs between these different decisions people are trying to make with evacuation and the high variability in fire, terms of fire behavior because of weather, wind changes, topography, means that the best decision is contextual. I might plan on leaving early, 
that may be my goal, maybe prepared, I may have everything in place, and then the fire hits suddenly, cuts off, cuts off the evacuation route, and my alternative has a tree across it. Um, or I might plan on staying and defending, but if it's extreme conditions, that's no longer a viable idea. So it's a complicated decision process for anybody to make and, to, and for responders to think about how do we plan for it. So in st previous natural hazard studies have tried to look at what influences evacuation decisions. Most of these are around hurricanes. Um, and those are, they looked at official cues, having a mandatory evacuation order or having officials tell you to leave, environmental cues in the case of wildfire that's going to be seeing smoke or embers or um, flames. Um, social cues can influence the decision, seeing pe other people evacuating, seeing businesses closed. Risk perception does, is influential, but it's kind of tricky how this different studies find out it's influential and not influential and that sort of thing. So even risk perception is not straightforward. The response efficacy, and that's basically how effective is this action in protecting something I care about? So is it an effective action? And then self-efficacy, can I do it? Do I have the ability to undertake this protective action? And then personal responsibility has been shown to be influential in people's decisions. With fire, I've absolutely talked to people who say, I've decided to stay because I chose to live here and it's my responsibility to protect my property. A firefighter should not be. They're not responsible for my property. Um, so in the study with Robin, William at, Robin Wilson at Ohio State, we set out to try to understand how these various factors came into play in terms of wildfire evacuations. And so we looked at all those things I just talked about and we added in another, a, a particular variable, which is risk attitudes. So it's not just how you perceive the risk, but how you respond to the risk. So different individuals have different attitudes towards risk. Some people are very risk tolerant. In fact, they seek out risk. They, they think it's great. And other people are really risk averse. And I was hearing homeowners who were like, oh no, I'm leaving early because, oh no, I'm no way I'm going to be anywhere near it. Very clearly risk averse. And then I was talking to homeowners who were like, oh yeah, we're going to stay. We're not really that worried about it and sort of very risk tolerant. And, and these were not homeowners who were not doing anything. They were very well prepared and knew what they were doing. So they weren't being casual. It was just, they were comfortable. So we wanted to see how that came into play. So we did um, surveys in three different locations in the United States, and uh, this was in 2015. The areas that we surveyed were all areas that had had a wildfire and evacuations in the past few years. And so we asked people sort of, what did you do when you were last threatened by a fire? And we divided those responses into sort of those three groups I just talked about, the leave early group. They left before there was a mandatory evacuation order which is kind of the classic definition of leave early, um, and then left as soon as there was a mandatory order. Uh, you note that 23%, only 23% fit into this leave early, and some would not consider leaving when there's a vac mandatory order as leave early. Uh, wait and see, they were waited to be told to leave, or they waited to see and didn't leave because the risk wasn't high enough, or they waited to see what would happen and felt left when the danger was too great. So those are very classic wait and see kind of thinking. And worth noting that that's 65% of the respondents, so two thirds of the population tends to take this approach. And the stay and defend group was around 11%. And I've done a couple other studies where we, again, it's pretty clear that in the US, there's 10% who are very clearly gonna stay and defend. And there's a good contingent who might intend to do it, be considering doing it, or just end up doing it. So we took those and grouped them and then did regression analysis to see were there, did, did different emphasis in these different variables lead to different decisions? So basically what you have in that column is the wait and see column is being compared to responses to wait and see people versus the leave early people and the stay and defend people versus the leave early people. And so yes means it was statistically significant. So if you look at the bottom, we had two risk perception questions. And those who said that they, who had a high family risk perception, if they said that, they were less likely to wait and see than stay early, and they were less likely to stay and defend than leave early. And similarly, you find that um, the more people relied or more importance people placed on the voluntary evacuation order or the mandatory order, 
the less likely they were to wait and see and stay in Japan. And the more the importance they placed on official cues, such as officials telling them to leave or official warnings, then the less likely they were to wait and see and stay and defend. But the more that they relied on physical cues, the more likely they were to wait and see and stay and defend. And MS just means it's marginally significant at 0.1, which is still pretty fairly significant, just a slightly larger chance that it's a false, false finding. And you, but you see there too that the stay and defend group also relied on physical cues and more likely to stay and defend. And then you see some indication that the um, wait and see group, if they were more likely to place a lot more importance on social cues, then they were less likely to wait and see than stay and then leave early. And then I talked about efficacy earlier. So we had questions where we asked them, how effective do you think this action in protecting life and in protecting your home? And people who thought that evacuation was really effective at protecting what they cared about were less likely to stay and defend than evacuate. That makes really good sense. And unsurprisingly, people who thought staying and defending was really effective at protecting what they cared about were more likely to, to stay and defend than leave early. And interestingly, people who thought that densible space and making your home more ignition resistance was effective were more likely to wait and see than leave early. So you kind of have the sense that maybe preparedness help makes people feel like they have a little more leeway to maneuver than not. And I think that's something worth thinking about. And in terms of preparedness knowledge, people who indicated that they were had more knowledge about what they needed to do to be well prepared were more li likely to stay and defend, which is really good. We want people who are gonna who are planning to do this to know what they are doing. And then in terms of risk attitudes, we found that as I kind of expected, people who were just generally risk tolerant were more likely to stay and defend than leave early. And then within risk attitudes, there's all these different domains. So you might be financially risk tolerant, but health risk tolerant. Or, or and uh, recreation in risk averse. And so there's these different domains and we found that people who are financially risk tolerant were less likely to stay and defend than to leave early, which kind of makes sense. If you're, you're not too worried about losing your home, you're just gonna leave early. And I've definitely met homeowners who say, I am staying. Um, we can't get insurance, we can't afford to lose our house, we have to stay and defend our property. So they just financially can't afford to leave. And then we also do this other statistical thing, which is called a latent class analysis, which basically tries to look at if you have certain groups of respondents based on specific, really distinct characteristics that they answer differently on. And it identified two classes. And based on the behavior of those classes, we labeled one class evacuation class where, you know, nobody in that class is going to stay, did stay and defend. And large portion of wait and see, and then the defend class is more mixed. But what distinguishes them is that the evacuation class just really had a, came out much more strongly in the belief in evacu evacuation efficacy. That's kind of what makes them inclined to lean towards evacuating. Whereas the defend class, it was really that general risk tolerance and that preparedness knowledge that made them lean towards defending. At the bottom, you have these common predictors, which are increases in evacuation order um, made everybody more likely to evacuate, but it had less of an effect on the defend class. And then for everybody, the importance you, as you place more value on official cues, you are more likely to evacuate. And then very interestingly, as sort of showing this contextual nature, you had these diverging predictors. So, in the evacuation class, the more emphasis they placed on physical cues, the more likely they were to wait and see. Whereas in the defend class, the more emphasis they placed on physical cues, the more likely they were to wait and see rather than to defend. And very similarly with that concern about limited notice. So what this kind of says to me is that people who um, are recognizing the contextual nature, they've kind of got a plan in mind, but there's these other factors that might shift them from that plan. And then I'm gonna talk um, about the takeaways from this one are um, that, you know, we have clear evidence that response efficacy matters, that that shapes the decision people take, that official cues are important to everyone, um, but that there's a big contingent that also rely on physical cues and those are the people who tend not to leave early. And that, um, 
Risk attitudes can be, may be as important as risk perception in understanding the different choices people make and the contingent nature of decisions in wildfire. So the people who greater reliance on physical cues or thinking you're not gonna get a warning appears to make people less um, likely to stick with their in initial intentions. And I could go both ways as to arguing whether or not this is good or bad. Some would argue you want people to make a plan and to stick with it, and not waffle. But I also think that people recognizing the contingency and recognizing alternatives is also critical, particularly given wildfire. So um, it just shows that more that people recognize the contingency of these things. So, oops. I'm gonna talk really quickly through another study that just came out, and this was on the Chimney Tops fire with Erica Kulingowski. And the Chimney Tops fire was the one that hit Gatlinburg in 2016, um, where they basically evacuated 14,000 residents and tourists in four hours, um, lost 14 people and 2,500 homes. And the key with this one is that it was a fire that was in the national park for several weeks or several days, and then it blew up in one day, hit the town very quickly, there was widespread power losses and loss of communication services, which had a big impact on the evacuation. And so we did a survey of people who were in the evacuated areas in 2018 and 19. And I think the first key takeaway here is that only 23% got a warning from any source. So when we look at evacuation, there's often this big emphasis on warnings and having people like how do we give better warnings and what's the right warning and what's the right time for a warning when the reality is increasingly I see cases where people don't get any warnings because the communication system fails. Um, as, and so I think that's something just to plan for and to recognize and to make in plans is like plan to give warnings but also plan on what you're going to do if the communication system goes down. And only 17% in total reported getting one or more official warnings. So again, we kind of default to just do what the official warning tells you and you'll be fine. And that's very problematic if only 17% are gonna get an official warning. So we asked them at the time, why did you, what did you do? Why did you evacuate? What were the main reasons? And again, in their responses, you can see how this was a fire that impacted them very rapidly because all of them are about seeing flames, being overcome by flames, or having their property catch on fire. But we also asked, uh, what were the other reasons that behind evacuating? And you had uh, things like fear for themselves or others, advice and orders from family, friends, or neighbors, orders or advice from emergency officials, information about location or intensity of the fire, and then seeing others. So you had that social cues going on. And then for the 13% who stayed, the main reasons they chose to stay were around that warning. Um, they were not ordered to evacuate, they didn't receive any warnings about the fire, or they were aware of the fire but didn't feel they were personally at risk. And when you look at the other reasons why they stayed, you see some of these other factors that I was telling you about of these trade-offs. They were protecting their property, they um, thought it was too late to safely evacuate, they felt it would be safer to stay put. Um, some of them were caring for animals or loved ones, that's a very common one and then uh, some also just had work to do, to keep, do their job. So then we did a regression analysis to try to look at what variables influence people, and we did a regression on risk perception at the time of the evacuation decision. That's, so that's a very specific risk perception at the time. And what interestingly, and then we also did a regression looking at what influenced the evacuation decision. So in terms of what influenced risk perception, it was kind of interesting. Seeing flames or embers increased risk perception. Smelling or seeing smoke decreased risk perception. Prior awareness of fire risks and having a graduate degree also decreased risk perception. And receiving a warning from a trusted source decreased risk perception, which is kind of interesting and not, I think, what you would expect or hope. But that actually plays out in a really interesting way. likely to evacuate than men, and fire preparation. Those who undertook some fire preparation actions at home prior to the event were roughly twice as likely to stay. So again, we're seeing that a similar finding from that other study where being prepared in some way makes people stick around longer or stay. Now we don't know from the survey if they were planning to stay, 
um, you know, they were planning to stay and defend or if that preparation just made them more, but clearly the preparation made them more comfortable with deciding to stay. And then the other reasons, well, um, it was marginally significant that those who had an evacuation plan prior to the event were more likely to evacuate. And here's the interesting part. Those who received warnings from a trusted source were more likely to evacuate. So how's that work? Getting warning from a trusted source lowers your risk perception, but higher risk perception is associated with deciding to evacuate, unless you got a warning from a trusted source, in which case you evacuate. And what I think is going on there is it's that contingent of people from the other study who just rely on official warnings and leave early. And so what they're waiting for is that official warning to tell them to go and then they're gonna do it. So they're waiting for other people to sort of tell them what to do. And so having the official tell them what to do sort of makes them, their risk perception goes down. Okay, now I know what I'm doing, I'm getting out of here, time to go. And so I think that's part of what's going on there. And here, what you find also is that official evacuation notice and face-to-face -face warnings were not significant, which seems surprising until you think about the fact that only 17% of the people got official warnings. So I think what's going on there is just simply the, um, the nature of this particular fire and official warnings just weren't a big player and they were overwhelmed by all the other factors. So takeaways from this one, when we, in this one, when we controlled for risk perception at the time of evacuation, fire cues and prior awareness of fire risks weren't influential. Um, smoke decreases risk perception. So that's an interesting one that kind of, we see that as a cue is that habituation that there'd been smoke for five days. So they were kind of like not worried about it or does it not provide a clear sense of the fire is nearby or does it make them think the fire is far away? But it's something to think about and to look into. But both of those in the reliance on physical cues kind of both studies highlight the fact that one thing that we need to be doing is help people understand how to interpret the physical cues. So what does smoke tell them and not tell them? And what does seeing flames tell them and not tell them? I've totally talked to people who say, oh, the fire, I could see the flames, but they're up on the ridge and we weren't worried. Do they understand how fast fire can move if the conditions are right? Um, information from a trusted source, decreased risk perception, positively associated with evacuation decision, which I've already talked about, and this preparation conundrum um, that twice as likely to stay. And so the kind of two, points to ponder from both of these studies in terms of like how we think about our outreach and how we think about our planning for evacuation is the importance of physical cues to a huge proportion of the population. And so helping them to appropriately assess wildfire cues and the challenges of making an accurate assessment. So we need to recognize that warnings are not relied on, solely relied on by a huge portion of the population and they may not get them. So we need to help them understand how to interpret the physical cues. And then this other one about like, okay, so we really do want everybody to prepare, even if they're gonna evacuate, but if that makes them, gives them a sense that they don't need to leave quite so quickly, um, we might wanna think about how we're communicating preparedness and its effectiveness and what leeway it does and doesn't give you. And that's, that's it. And my apologies for not having a video. It's, it's being squirrely. Thank you so much, Sarah. We um, appreciate that presentation. Uh, and no worries on the video front. I think we've all been plagued with a little bit of, of tech trouble today. So we do have it, a few it questions It is good for to you. see a lot of very familiar names. <laughs> we, well, <laughs> that's good. We do have a few questions for you in the chat box. Um, Cindy Latham asks if there's any guidance uh, out there about what the best practices are for official warning systems. Uh, their community is having some issues with Code Red um, as an evacuation system and was hoping to evaluate other resources. There are, there is guidance. And actually, um, for that, I would point you to my co-author on the last, um, Erica Kulingowski. I can, I can get you some links to her work, but unlike Matt, I'm not adept at like doing it instantaneously. So um, I will supply those to Annie and they can get out to everybody else that way. Fantastic. Um, the next question comes to you from EJ, and that was whether or not the media in the study um, includes social media. And I believe that was in reference to the second study 
Um, did you find anything about the three levels of evacuation and how those were interpreted? Uh, so I'm not sure which media you're referring to, but um, I don't remember the breakdown in that second study of, of social media and stuff. So I would have to look at that to be sure. Um, but in, in the end, sort of the decision process on the Gatlinburg fire, there it was just haphazard. And my guess is social media was, I'll, I'll look for it, but my guess is social media wasn't that critical because, um, you know, like communication systems were down. And about the three levels of evacuation and how those were interpreted. Um, I think if you looked at the notices for Gatlinburg, they started ev evacuating at six. And because of communication issues, the official evacuation notices didn't actually go out till 9 p.m. and 9.47 p.m. So I think at that point, there was like, it was just all mandatory. It was like, get out now. Um, so they moved very quickly from voluntary to mandatory. And, and if only 17% got those notices, then I don't know that you'd, we would have had enough data to look at that. And I, we didn't really look at it anyhow. Fantastic. Um, the next question comes to us from Phil. Have you seen parcel level fire risk map used successfully to communicate to homeowners that their neighborhood is safe rather than just the one parcel? Yes. I, I mean, I'm not sure. I, my, 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 my caution was that um, that question about communicate their neighbor is neighborhood is safe that rather than just their one parcel. You mean, if, if you mean in terms of trying to show them that enough work has been done to make the whole neighborhood safe. Mostly when I've seen the fire parcel level, they're used to communicate the risk to the individual homeowner. Um, and in those cases, they can be very effective. They can also make people go talk to their neighbor when they see that their neighbor's risk isn't doing is high risk too. Um, it can also make people talk to their neighbor and have their neighbor say, "I don't care," and then they do more or they do less because there's no point. So I have seen parcel level maps used at the individual. I don't know that I've seen it at the full neighborhood. And I think the challenge there is, I don't think we have good data yet as to how many parcels you have to have and in what configuration to say the neighborhood is safer. So some of that would depend on like the layout of the community. If the houses are all cheek by jowl, then it's gonna be much more obvious that you need everybody or it, particularly those on the edge to have mitigated for the community to be safer. But if they're larger parcels, that's an interesting collective action problem that we don't have enough data to sort of understand at what point it is a collective action problem and at what point the individual parcel has their own risk and their own control. So. Thanks. Um, so our, our next question has to do with um, evacuation sirens. Um, participants notes that more communities are moving toward or moving back toward um, use of an audible physical siren to indicate the need to evacuate. Is there any data to support this as effective or something for more communities to consider? I don't know that there's any data to indicate it's effective for fire because it is a new kind of practice. I do know that for other things like tornadoes, there is data and part of what they show is it's complicated. So first of all, you have to train people so they understand exactly what the warning is and what they should do for the warning. Um, and so that's, I think, the big challenge with communities going to sirens is like, if you have a community-wide siren that doesn't necessarily tell people where the fire is and who needs to evacuate and all of you know that, and then you you can have these jammed roads. So I think I understand the impulse to have a siren, but I think if a community has a siren, they have to be very systematic about communicating to the community what when it will be used, when it's used, what it means, um, and what the proper action is to take. And for that, you'd have to really think through the planning for your community and what you want, how you want people to behave. Is it simply, there's a fire in the area, please check your, your system. 
I would actually argue that, um, well, that would depend on the community. But the, the WIA system, the wireless emergency um, response system, actually is probably a better way to go if you don't wait to use it, because then you can actually send a, a text message and tell people um, like where the fire is and what they need to do. And that there's really clear evidence that that is more likely to motivate people to take good action than, than not. So you get the best evacuation when you have a good warning message that says, there's a fire here, here's where it's going, here's what you should, you should be doing now, here's where you should go, that kind of thing. So very specific but succinct message that tells people exactly what the, what the risk is and what they should do. And the problem with a siren is there's just too many variables on what that siren might be telling people to do. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah.